the next chapter Babu La'an Allahu Man La'an Walidayh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses or la'an can have different meanings. La'anat here can mean Allah punishes or keeps away from his mercy or a simple curse. All three explanations have been given. La'an Allahu man la'an walidayh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps away from his mercy. Allah curses or Allah will punish that individual who curses his parents. The hadith Abu Tufail he says, Qala su'il Aliyun radiallahu ta'ala an. He says, Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, who was once asked, Hal khassakum al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam bi shayin that has the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam provided you or given you certain ilm that he hasn't given others specifically to you. The riwayat of Muslim is that a man came to Ali radiallahu ta'ala and said that do you have ilm from the Prophet sallallahu that you've not shared with anybody else that he's given you but you've not conveyed to the others so Ali radiallahu ta'ala became extremely upset that the Prophet sallallahu has not given me something specific in terms of ilm that I haven't conveyed to others except there are a few words that he mentioned to me that I had recorded secretly or I had kept specifically on a piece of paper and the hadith explains لم يخص به النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كافة. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم had not specified me with anything that he hadn't told the other people. قال ما خصنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بشيء لم يخص به الناس إلا ما في قراب سيفه. The only thing that I have which others might not have is what I have in my scabbard of my uh, where I seize my sword. He had a piece of paper inside there. ثم أخرج صحيفة he removed that piece of paper فإذا فيه فيها مكتوب and on that piece of paper was the following that was written number one لعن الله من ذبح لغير الله the curse of Allah be upon that person who slaughters on the name other than Allah who sacrifices for other than Allah لعن الله من سرق منار الأرض May the curse of Allah be upon that person who steals the landmarks or the boundaries of the earth. And I'll explain what that means. Number three, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ مَنْ لَعَنَ وَالِدَيْهِ And Allah cursed that individual who curses his parents. And number four, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ مَنْ آوَى مُحْدِثًا May Allah curse or keep distant from his mercy that individual who harbors a muhdith. And muhdith has different interpretations of just left it with the Arabic at the moment. In this hadith, the Prophet uh, Ali radiallahu ta'ala was saying that Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed him of four people who were distant from the mercy of Allah. Now again, just to repeat what I started with, la'an Allah, this term can either mean may Allah curse, so it may be a dua from the Arabic perspective, or it could be informative that Allah has cursed this person. So there are two ways of looking at this, la'an Allah. Number one, may Allah curse the following four people. So this is a dua from the Messenger of Allah. Or number two, the Prophet is making a statement that Allah has cursed these four people. And as I mentioned, what's meant by being cursed by Allah, number one, being cursed by Allah. Number two, the curse refers to being distant from the mercy of Allah. La'anatullah means being distant from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or number three, may the punishment of Allah be upon this particular person. Okay. So now what are these four people that were specified by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? A bit of uh, a look into them. Man dhabaha li ghayrillah. Whoever sacrifices an animal makes a sacrifice on other than Allah's name. Doesn't matter who the sacrificer, who the person that's sacrificing is. Who's offering the sacrifice? Could be a Muslim, non-Muslim, irrespective. But whatever is sacrificed on other than Allah's name, a condition for an offering of sacrifice. When does an offering of sacrifice take place? When does an offering of sacrifice take place? Eid al-Adha. Eid al-Adha. So at the time of Eid is what's being referred to, and that's why Imam Muslim brings this hadith in the chapter of uh, sacrificial animals. 
So at the time of Eid is when it's the only time in the year where you make a sacrifice in terms of ibadat. At the other times, it's either for thanks at aqika or to eat food, which isn't offering a sacrificial animal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sacrificial animal is offered at the time of Eid al-Adha. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying anybody who sacrifices on other than the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now that can be a name of a prophet, name of angels, the name of Muhammad ﷺ. Irrespective of what other than Allah, a sacrifice is not permissible. You're not allowed to sacrifice on a name other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَكُلُوا مِمَّا ذُكِرَ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, eat from that which Allah's name has been taken upon. Mm-hmm. It's a condition of sacrificial animal. That alongside the tasmiyah, bismillah, Allahu Akbar with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a condition of the sacrifice. That you take Allah's name before you sacrifice the animal. Okay? So the sacrificial animal is not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except with Allah's name. And the one who does so on another person's name Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses that person. لَعَنَ اللَّهُ مَنْ سَرَكَ مَنَارَ الْأَرْضِ That may Allah's curse be upon that person who steals from the boundaries of the earth. Generally this is understood that there are hudud, there are boundaries for kingdoms, for countries. To usurp from the other country is a gross, gross infringement. However, it's not limited to governments. This trickles down, this hadith trickles down to usurping land from anybody else. So you know sometimes we have boundary disputes between uh, property holders. That your neighbor, your property is here. And that you have to be extremely careful that you don't take what's not yours. To take what is not yours, it's considered a grotesque sin in the eyes of Allah. There's a hadith that says the person who takes an inch of land that doesn't belong to them, they will be buried in the ground 70 times over in the hereafter. A huge sin. Tawwika in the earth. So this hadith actually implies not just specifically to boundaries of governments, but boundaries of individuals as well. So you have to be extremely careful that you don't take what is not yours. And that's just boundaries. What you have a lot of problem with, maybe not in this country because laws are a bit more engraved and title deeds are much more sort of, uh, they go through solicitors, etc. But back home, there is a huge problem of people, of brothers taking the land of their brothers, of uh, family members, their land because they're living somewhere else. So a family member is living in the UK and their land is being usurped back home. And this hadith implies that that la'an Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses that person. Allah curses that individual who uh, steals from the landmarks, the boundaries on the earth. So it's, a, it's an extremely grave sin and it's something that happens a lot back home. Where people's uh, family inheritance when it's distributed, then land is taken that doesn't belong to them. And the reason behind that is because land back home... Uh, for a long time it was worthless and now it's worth a lot of money and so money brings about a lot of greed and so because of that money being available subhanallah i hear stories and cases of all the time of how people have been have taken their sisters their brothers land and just refuse to give back and they don't understand the seriousness of it from a, from the perspective of the sharia the third, لَعَنَ Allah مَنْ لَعَنَ walidayh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses and makes distant from his mercy that individual who curses his parents. Once the Sahaba Kiram Allah was sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and he mentioned the same thing. That Allah curses that individual who swears and curses at their parents. Here, cursing the parents takes the form of actual cursing or swearing. Everything comes into that context. So the Sahaba, they said, Ya Rasulullah, someone would swear at their own parents? They couldn't fathom this. They couldn't understand this. That someone used foul language towards their own parents? So on that occasion, the Prophet explained how it's possible to the understanding of the Sahaba. 
So he said, Naam. That if you swear at somebody's parents, then that person to reciprocate swears back at your parents. So in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there wasn't that, the, like I said, there was an element of being respectful to one's parents. So the notion that someone would swear at their parents was very alien, very difficult to comprehend. So that's why there are two understandings. One, in, as which the Prophet Sallallahu explained there, that when someone, when you quarrel with somebody and you swear at their parents, what's the natural reaction that's going to happen? Is that they're going to swear back at your parents. So in essence, you are the cause of your parents being sworn at, being cursed at. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَعَنَ Allah. Allah cursed that person who swears at that person, uh, who swears at their parents. So this hadith tells us that even if it's not you who is directly cursing or swearing their parent, at their parents, if you are the cause of it, then you also fall under the context of this hadith. So you need to be very careful, extremely careful. And that is not just taken from the hadith, that's specifically mentioned in another hadith. Well, when the Sahabas inquired that, how can a person swear at the parents? The Prophet explained that how do they swear at their parents? By swearing at somebody else's parents, and that person then swears back at your parents. So the Prophet has specifically told us that if you are indirectly the cause because you are cursing somebody's parents, if you are the cause of them cursing your parents, you fall under the context of this hadith. That Allah curses you. Now, the reason why this is important is many of us, when we get into conflict, many, especially with the... Well, it's not, it's not just the young. You know, just the other day I was having a conversation... And someone was telling me there was a, na'udhu billah, a fight in the masjid, in one of the masjids. Uh, and in that, in that quarrel, they were hurling abuses at one's, each other's parents in the masjid. So even elders do this. But generally when people quarrel, what's one? Because the, what one wants to do is, is cause as much anguish and grief and hurt to the person they're quarreling with. That's how, that's, how, that's how the psyche works. That if I'm disputing with you, I want to do something that hurts you the most. And what's something that really enrages a person is if you talk about their parents. You can say whatever you want to them, it doesn't, it doesn't bother. Okay, fine. You know, thick skin, it's fine. I can, I can deal with it. Say whatever you want. The moment you take the mother or father's name, it's a different reaction. Different reaction. Because that provokes a sense of ghayra that I need to defend my parents. It provokes something inside an individual. And so, generally, when people quarrel, especially verbal quarrels, this is how people behave. That to get their uh, anger across to the other person, to let them know how much they're upset with them, they start hurling abuse at parents. The Prophet ﷺ said, this is a cause of a being cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if they hurl abuse back, you are the cause of your parents being cursed and sworn at. Number one. Number two, the Sahabas didn't understand. But in this day and age, there are people who directly swear and curse at their own parents. Sahabas couldn't understand this. That's why they asked Ya Rasulullah, how does someone curse their own parents or swear at their own parents? Unfortunately, we live in a time where foul language and abuse of the parents is common. Using language that is abusive to the parents, it's not something that doesn't happen. It's not even something that people sort of look back at and frown upon. It's just something that happens. And so that is even... The Prophet ﷺ said, you are indirectly the cause of your parents being cursed. That's why you're cursed by Allah. Imagine how much more severe it when, when you are directly cursing your parents and swearing at your parents. That how much more of an implication this hadith, the la'anat, the curse of Allah be upon that person. So when we are addressing our parents, when we're speaking to our parents, when our parents are upset with us, and they may raise their voice, so they may even shout at you. They may even say things that you feel is unwarranted. Be very careful of how you respond. 
like I said, la'ana towards the parents doesn't just imply that you say Allah's curse be upon you. It's swearing at them as well. Swearing at your parents results in Allah's curse being directed towards you. You being made distant from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Extremely, extremely grave uh, how, uh, if you're not careful with how you speak to your parents, the implications of that. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes angered and disappointed with that. So when you're in that situation and you, you feel that there is even at times unnecessary anger being directed towards you, remember, don't put yourself in a more precarious situation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes it's best to just stay quiet. Let the anger be vented. And then after a few moments, your parents' anger will subside. Believe me, that's how it works. But to react with anger and to use foul language with them, the hadith tells us directly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses that individual. If you're under the curse of Allah, if you're made distant from the mercy of Allah, what do you have then? What, what hope do you have? What benefit do you have? What kind of good can you expect from that day that's going to come forward when you're under the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There cannot be any possible good that comes if Allah has cursed you, if Allah has made you distant from His mercy. So be extremely careful. There are situations where tensions are high, you're being told love, you're being shouted at. Do not swear. Never, ever, ever swear at your parents. And finally, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ مَنْ آوَى مُحْدِثًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may he curse that individual who harbors a muhdith. Muhdith, two meanings, someone who's uh, habitual of bid'ah, a bid'ati, um, who brings about innovations into the deen. Or number two, muhdith means someone who is oppressive to others and who is now uh, being charged by the state for his crime and you are harboring that criminal and avoiding him receiving the crime, the had that the sharia has laid down upon him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the understanding. This chapter heading is very, very obvious to the actual hadith and the relevance to it. Allah grant us the tawfiq to understand just the overwhelming importance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put with respect to our relationship to our parents. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from using that type of language or that type of tone that offends our parents. وآخر الدعوة الحمد لله رب العالمين سبحان الله بحمد سبحان الله بحمد كن شر ولا إله إلا أنت نستغفر نتوب إليك. We were speaking about detestable مكروه things during the fast, using foul language, speaking of evil things and lewd things is also مكروه. It's also detestable. And the way, let's get through the complexities or the understanding of the technicalities here. There are certain things that are invalidators of the Salah. And invalidators means that by doing those things, your actual fast is broken. Meaning you have to repeat it. It's not in the end. There are two types of invalidators. One that means that you have to make the fast up again. And one that is, means that you have to make the fast along with a penalty. 60, 60 days of continuous fasting. Two types of invalidators. Okay. There are certain things that invalidate the spirit of the fast. But it doesn't invalidate the fast itself. Understand the difference? One is invalidate where you have to do qadha, you have to make it up. Or you have to do kafara, you have to pay the compensation. And there's another type of invalidator that doesn't invalidate the actual fast. Meaning you fast is, if you did these things for all 30 days, you'd still have 30 days of fasting complete. But the spirit of the fast is lost. And those, a lot of them are these makroo, detestable, when we say makruh, don't take makruh undesirable as something that's small. Detestable means it's not liked. You should not become habitual of detestable acts. And one act that's extremely de detestable whilst fasting, it takes away the spirit of the fast. Your fast will remain intact, but it takes away the spirit. Meaning the virtue, the benefit, the rahmah, the mercy that's supposed to be attracted by a fasting person is lost is by using foul language is by quarreling, is by swearing. And it's why the Prophet وسلم, he actually said in the hadith, that if someone comes to quarrel with you, ahadun, or someone swears at you, inni sahim, don't engage. Just raise your hands, stay back and say, I'm fasting, I cannot engage with you. Do not, even if you are in the right, 
To quarrel takes away that spirit of the fast. It takes away that virtue of the fast. It takes away all those blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending down on that fasting person. So from the detestable acts, doesn't does invalidate, but it takes away the virtue, it takes away the spirit, it takes away all that Allah is giving in terms of mercy, is swearing, is using foul language, is using language to offend other people, or to quarrel with other people. Allah grant us all the understanding.